Okay, so our last speaker is Kai Min Chung, and he will talk about randomness amplification. Can you see this? Use this. Yeah. Test? Yeah. Okay, I'm good. Okay. Um, well, I mean, actually, I want to first just tell you about the title, but I think I've just been called Kai Min Chung, which is not really me. So Kai Min is uh, my co author sitting uh, in the audience, and uh, he's just uh, two computer scientists to be. Uh, really, you know, show my slides. So, so I'm the person here. So I'm Shadi from University of Oregon. So uh, our work is about the, the general random random amplification with non-signaling security. So if you have trouble understanding the keyword in the title, that's totally fine. That means you have something. Uh, I mean, not this kind of thing, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so you have, you have something to take home. So this is John's work with uh, Yao Yunxi and Kai Min. So Kai Min may help me just answer your question if I fail to do that. So uh, I think the last talk is a bit overwhelming, but let me just uh, show something, you know, maybe just like a happy story and you can get something. So, so let me just pretend to be a, a theoretical physicist and like, you know, what John Prisco told us, you know, this good time for quantum information theorists to jump into the black hole and this is like the top picture. I got from, by Googling that, you see this is like a LIGO picture for the collision of a two black hole. And I just uh, held on that thought. I still want to work on something, you know, start a fundamental physics question, but maybe that's more accessible for, for us, for, you know, as a computer scientist. So this is a too much. But I think, uh, you know, so this talk is really about one problem, uh, you know, we can do as a computer scientist and something you know about fundamental physics. So what's it about? So it's about the randomness. Or you know, it's like maybe even more fundamental question or philosophical question. Is our world deterministic? Or how could fundamentally unpredictable events be possible and certifiable? So well I mean just showing the, the pessimistic part side of this question, we cannot be sure without believing of its existence. So it could be the case that we're like, you know, those people start you know, living in the movie matrix as so some battery from the machine. We're living, you know, all of us just controlled by some machine where, you know, some, you know, totally deterministic mechanics running behind everything. We cannot rule out that possibility. But, you know, somehow if you believe that, that's the end of the talk. Uh, <laughs> by the way, trying to be a more optimistic so let's think, what if you know, there's some you know, possibility that it's not this case? So what we can do? So maybe we can think about something like if the word is either deterministic or maybe it's not deterministic, what we can say about it? So here's the, our question. So does non-deterministic word imply a truly random word? So you see there's a gap. You know, the gap is that even though the word is not, you know, deterministic, that does not mean you can have like perfect random events exist in your word. So, so what I, you know, we're asking, actually this is first asked by Kobach Renner, is to see the possibility of uh, establishing a dichotomy theorem. And what, in order to do that, so this is a high, very high level picture. So assume you have some well, I don't see my point. Okay, so you have some a little bit of non-deterministic thing, so which I just roughly call the weak uncertainty for now. But we'll see, you know, the mathematics structure of that later. So we want to have some kind of procedure to amplify this weak uncertainty to a full uncertainty, which means uniform bits or uniform events. And by doing that, we don't want to introduce any actual randomness. So if we can achieve such a thing. And then we can achieve some dichotomy theorem basically says either the word is deterministic or we can fully create a uniform random events. So this is what you know, this talk is really about. That this is the question we want to do. And of course, you know, this is always the easy part. And we want to live in the you know, slightly harder part where we assume, you know, work on the, the case where the word is not deterministic. OK. And you see, this is a really, uh, you know, very fundamental physics question, and even you know, philosophical question. And indeed, that's why this, you know, the problem was proposed by physicist by Kobach Renner in 2012. 
you know, they ask the question, can we certify the existence of a true randomness based on physical laws? And I interpreted it a little bit in terms of a computer science. So what this is really asking is that can we generate uniform bits from weak source and we want to under minimum assumptions? Okay. So just let me be more specific about this question. You know, by introducing you, you know, in a model to just really talk about things more concretely. So we imagine we have uh, some system, you know, that's the system, or you can imagine you know, some experiments or whatever it is, to well generate one a single bit. Okay, a single bit out. And then you do have the uh, you know, observer, which I basically, the, that's the rest of the world. And we want to, of course, to, to see whether it's possible that this particular bit B will be like you know uniform bits in the eye of these uh, the observer E. And of course, as I just mentioned, you, you don't want to live in a deterministic world where you don't have anything to be random. So there's a first necessary assumption for this to hold is that you need to have a weak source or some uncertainty to start with. But how you know? But just by formulating in this way, you immediately see there should be another necessary assumption. So what's that as necessary assumption? Which is kind of trivial is that you can now design the system to basically signaling B to E. So the system needs to keep this B. I mean, without just telling E what it is. And we do have a term, especially when people study the foundation for quantum mechanics or even you know foundation of any physics theorem. That's called non-signaling condition. So we want that to hold between system and it. So basically, we show there are two necessary assumptions you know, in order to make this happen. OK? Um, so let me just uh, show you some, you know, maybe you have already think about this question. You have some solutions. So let me just tell you some uh, seemingly working uh, solutions, but actually they're requiring additional assumptions. So first, let's assume your system is totally classical. And this actually has been a well-studied question uh, in the topic called randomness extraction. And there, uh, I, I want to just uh, you know, ignore many technical detail. But the, the key thing is that you always need to rec uh, have independent weak source. That means you, you, don't have, you, you cannot just have one. You may need to have more. And then you need to have independent uh, assumption between them in order for you to do anything like this. Okay, and of course, you know, this is QIP, why you're using classical system. So how about quantum system? And we do have something called, you know, quantum randomness, uh, uh, random number generator is already commercialized product. And if you look into the mathematics of uh, quantum mechanics, you see this is like intrinsically random, you know, stuff. So why can't you just get out of this random bit by just, you know, using quantum mechanics or quantum devices? So there's the first level question about this, and this is more like a practical level of saying, that is, says, you know, how can you uh, be sure you know, this device, especially the device in your particular experiment, does exactly what you want, or it does exactly what it's you know, meant to be? So we basically assume you know, this is correct. You know, it does everything we want, so we can be sure it's you know, some random bit. So we have the additional assumption like, you know, we assume the correctness of the quantum device. If we don't want to assume that, so the alternative way is that we need to perform some certification of things. So that's like the first layer of question. So if there's even more fundamental issue if we, you know, want to take this approach. So does the randomness, you know, they truly just come from assuming quantum mechanics? Well. If you, uh, you know, believe the quantum mechanics explain the inner working of the nature, well, that's the case you can possibly say, you know, this is, uh, you know, random. And in that case, we basically just rule out the, the determinist word. You know, we don't need to start to think about the question from the very beginning. If we want to keep the assumption that, you know, or the possibility that we could live in a determinist world, so that means quantum mechanics can be incomplete. So there could be alternative determinist theory explain what we have seen so far, and it's consistent with the prediction of quantum mechanics. 
then in that case, we can still not you know, c conclude this is random by just uh, you know, believing quantum mechanics and is the mathematics behind it. Okay, so, so here's the question. You know, we have seen you know, something close to what we want, but we don't want to assume you know, quantum mechanics explain the, the nature and we don't want to trust all the devices you know, we're using. Can we still generate a uniform bits from weak sources? So that's the question we really want to do for in this talk. Okay, and if you just stare at this words, I mean, if you, I mean, have been working on a little bit in, you know, attend this session, maybe know words about device independent uh, cryptography. So maybe this rings a bell. So basically, this is exactly what we meant to do in the device independent cryptography. So just let me uh, elaborate a little bit on that. So in, you know, the device independent cryptography basically says we don't want to trust uh, the inner working of any devices due to either technical or maybe even more fundamental issues. But still, uh, we want to leverage those machines. They are quantum machines, and we are human beings. We can only use classical operations. So that's what device independent quantum cryptography does. And how this is possible as a you know classical human being to do that? So this is uh, you know the key tool we're using. We use the Bell test to detect the non-locality in quantum system, and we force them to be quantum, or maybe even force them to, you know, just go away from the classical region. And by using that, you know, we can achieve a lot of, lot of things. And this is a, a, you know, incomplete list of all the successful examples, and if you hear, you see the other previous talk, they can be sought as special cases in the device independent, you know, study. And we're going to have one, I think, right after this, the planner talk about, you know, device independent QKD. Okay. So basically, this will all be the framework we are using to solve our problem. So just let's get back to our problem. Um, so this is a callback render 2012 paper. And they say they want to certify two renderings from, you know, weak renderings. And they want to adapt the device independent framework and by using the bell violation to do that. And they, they gave it a name. This is called randomness amplification. So we, we've seen there are two necessary assumptions as, uh, you know, in the beginning of this talk. I say you need to have uh, some assumption on this you know, weak source or some uncertainty. And the other assumption is that uh, you want to have non signaling uh, you know, condition. So. So uh, here's the, the way that the callback render models the first one. So what do, you know, do we mean by weak source? So the proposal of a callback render is to basically say weak source is equivalent to CSF as a running source. And the mathematically, it says it's a just a, you know MB string. Uh, I don't see my pointer. But. So it's MB string. And if you look at every single bit, Condition on the you know any possible uh, you know fixing number uh, bits of all the press one it still have some uncertainty. So if you look at this uh, inequality, if epsilon is zero, then the next bit will be perfectly uniform, and epsilon is large, then it's become more biased. And the reason why we you know think this is a good um, modeling of the weak source, I think there are physical principle behind choosing this one, and this is a beautiful argument in the original paper by Kobach and Rainer, which I probably don't have time to go into details right now. And what they can do, so they can use you know the framework I just mentioned, you know, modulate some technical condition that they can amplify from any epsilon SV source where epsilon is a, you know, a very small number here. It's like it's close to be uniform, but it's not perfect uniform. And they can distill one uniform bits out of it. Okay. And here's the roughly the, you know the protocol. So so basically we we have the Eve, which is you know just model as the the rest of the world, and he, he has the device you know A and B, which is you know we don't trust. We only see the classical, uh, you know input output of the device, and you know the the the, uh, the most important thing is that those devices didn't commute. So we have some you know non-signaling condition, you know position on that, 
and the address has some S3 source. So, you know, you know, Shira has some way to choose the input from the S3 source, you know, gets output, and to see whether this passed some tests or not, and if it passes the test, and we choose still from S3 source, you know, select what's the output of the final protocol. And, you know, what Eve does is you need to get the output of Iris. If Eve cannot, uh, you know, by using like, uh, you know, putting some uh, operations on uh, her side and uh, observing the output to guess Alice's uh, output correctly, then, you know, this uh, output, uh, output uh, Alice's output will be look uniform to it. So that's roughly, uh, you know, what the callback render protocol does, and they achieve this for, you know, epsilon SV source. So just let's go back to put this uh, uh, protocol back to, into our context, talking about the dichotomy theorem. So we want to have uh, that common theorem say either it's deterministic or it can be certifi uh, certifiable random. So here we have, uh, you know, S3 source uh, model as the weak randomness, and you can have a way to, to certify it to be, a, you know, one uniform bit by using Cobax Renner's uh, protocol. And of course, remember, uh, you know, here we are uh, a modulized, uh, you know, I just don't go into many technical conditions, but you see, if we can weaker, you know, all the assumptions on this procedure, then we get a stronger dichotomy theorem. So another uh, dimension, which uh, I didn't mention, but uh, this also requires that we want the non-signaling security. You know, we have already talked about the assumption on the weak source. So what's the non-signaling security? So, so roughly speaking, basically, uh, you can allow the, your EV have uh, any non-signaling correlations with uh, you know all the devices, and still you want um, the output is uh, you know it's uh, uniform to the adversary. So the reason why non-signal security is stronger is because just taking CHSH for example, um, it, if you share non-signal security, you can win this you know game perfectly. But if you ha only have quantum uh, power, you cannot win this perfectly. So potentially non-signal security will, you know, provide you know power even you know more powerful adversary to guess about a bit. So this poses a stronger you know requirement on the security. So as I said, Kobach Rainer, you know, is the first to uh, result on on this uh, topic, and we do see a lot of uh, development of all this, uh, you know, redness amplification protocols. Where they improve both on you know the epsilon for the, all the SV source, and also improve the security to be non-signaling, and there are other dimensions like, which I don't you know put on the table like you know uh, you know whether the, you know this protocol is robust to some like honest noise in the implementation, or maybe you know if you consider how many boxes you you need to use. Okay. So that's all the positive, uh, you know, result we got from the development of randomness amplification protocols, and they're all good. There are a lot of, uh, you know, techniques developed, you know, uh, in this development, and I didn't really talk about this part of the story, the you know, the, the right column, because that's the part, you know, we are, you know, our result is really about, and we have some, uh, you know. Uh, I think it's like we, we found something that we would like to improve on all the existing running amplification protocol. And uh, the part we want to improve on is about the source. So just to recall, so all the previous ones uh, running amplification protocol, they always assume there's a S3 source as your input. And so firstly, as a you know, computer scientist, uh, you know, just um, you know, give away about the physical intuition, we think this uh, SV source is still a very strong assumption. It guarantees entropy for every single bit. Now, if we want to go back into the, uh, the physical argument uh, by Kobach Rainer to see why they model uh, the weak source as a SV source, you know, they can, uh, you know, this is, can still be questionable, although I'm not sure whether, you know, I'm the right person to do that. But you see, they require SV bit to be, uh, at the, like a bit level, so for every new bit, it needs to be have some uncertainty condition on the first bit. 
So it could be the case uh, you still have SV structure, but it's like blockwise. You don't have uh, you know that strong uh, you know uh, you know condition on, on every every single bit. Um, and the third is that for the, all the following development, uh, you know, in order to achieve better parameters or uh, you know reduce number of boxes or achieve like robustness in the noise uh, and they always require some additional assumption about like the um, the relation between the source and device or the source and the adversary. You know, they require some kind of independence. So of course, I think some of can, you know this condition can be justified if you believe in more principle in physics, or some can be justified if you think you know that's the way we can do the experiments. But you know, as a, just a proof of principle, or you know. Uh, you know, as a pure, you know, serious study, um, can we uh, reduce all these assumptions on the source to the minimum, to the only source and you know, assumption we really require? We don't want to have any more assumptions at, other than necessary. And then, basically, this is what uh, we want to do. You know, this is what differs uh, our result from all the previous result. So in order to do that, we want to first know what you know do we mean by like a minimal uh, condition on the source. So this just goes back to our you know the first principle question. We want to achieve a dichotomy theorem. So so basically, we want to ask what's the minimal weak source in a non-determinist world. And so our you know proposal is the mean attribute source. And if you look at this condition, you know, the definition for mean attribute source in the classical world basically says it's the minus log of the maximal probability of guessing that. And if it's search, you know, it's something deterministic, you have perfect, you know, probability of guessing that, and that's zero. And it, you know, this can be easily extended if you have like a non-signaling correlation. You still define it in the operational way. You want to ask what's the uh, the log of the min uh, you know, the minus log of the maximum probability of guessing that source. And uh, so just a you know, side note, this is, a, this is a general measure of the randomness. And actually, this is something well defined in the classical literature of randomness extraction. It captures the amount of a uniform bits can be extracted you know, using classical means. And the more importantly for us and for the dichotomy theorem is that if the word is non-deterministic, that means there should be some uncertainty, and your guessing probability won't be 1. And if you use this kind of definition, so that means you have non-zero mean entropy. And that's almost uh, you know, as the minimal assumption we can achieve. So that's we, why we want to use this uh, you know, uh, notion to model the weak source. And by using this kind of notion, so, we, uh, so what we have achieved, uh, and this is also talking QIP 2014, is that we are uh, using the no uh, notion of a mean entropy source, and we can uh, you know, do the running amplification, and we don't assume anything uh, you know on the source relation with the device and uh, the adversary, other than it has some kind of mean entropy, and we can do that you know achieving the quantum security, where we assume you know the adversary sharing some you know quantum correlation with the devices, and what we you know uh, you know uh, have in this year QIP is that basically we improve this quantum to non-signaling. So in a one language, uh, in a one line message for this talk is that we have a random amplification protocol for any mean attribute source achieving non-signaling security, and we don't assume any other assumption than that. And I, if I can give you something more specific, so this is like a, on a technical level what we have. So we assume your source has a little bit on you know, mean entropy condition on the device not even condition the adversary. And we assume that even the, the adversary and the device sharing non-signaling uh, condition. So we don't assume anything else. So, so basically, uh, so what we get can give you uh, what we call the idea of dichotomy theorem, where you model the weak source by just the mean entropy. And we, act, you know, technically what we achieve is even more than that. Because we only require you have some mean entropy if you only look at the local system of the source and device, you don't even look at the adversary system. So it's like a local uncertainty can imply global, uh, you know, certifiable global randomness. So that's our, our result. So do we have any questions so far? 
Okay. So I, I, I will give you a, you know, just brief a high level review of how we achieved this um, in the rest of the talk. So, um, so when talking about our constructions, I, mean, I think it's good to see what I have done for all the, all the rest of the talk, you know, the protocols we see in the running simplification. So basically this is like a typical one. You get SV source, uh, you just use the SV source, directly put it into the device, and you design very, uh, you know, sometimes sophisticated games and make use of S3 structures, and you hope your output is good. Now, usually, that uh, takes a lot, uh, you know, and, you know, effort in analyzing those games, and we don't know how to handle, you know, unstructured uh, mean entropy source by using that. So, so what we have done is that we borrow some ideas from, you know. Computer science study, or more specifically, I think the ideas in crypto. So we want to, um, you know, instead of directly using the input to fit in all the devices, we do some like a classical pre-processing, and we want to, you know, somehow massage the the source such that we have some nice property. And nice property here is that we want to have something is called somewhere randomness. Which I, you know, just go uh, uh, talk a little bit more, and in the second step, because uh, it's just some randomness, there should be some correlations among those blockers. We want to have some way to decouple those uh, correlations, and there's a technical uh, goal we want to uh, basically want to achieve is that in order to decouple those correlations, uh, we need to have uh, some quantum protocol when your input is correlated. But uh, this output can be totally decoupled, and we can be sure you know there's such you know zi exists among all those blocks, and uh, you basically using the XOR to pick the right one. You don't know which one is good, but you can use XOR to pick the right one. Okay, so so this is basically the same exactly the same framework we use for our you know QIP 2014 talk. It's a, about the quantum security, and if you're happy with this, and you can easily see. Uh, what we need to do is basically extend this to the non-signal security, and that's exactly what we have done. And you know, unfortunately, it's not really that simple as you know you might thought or maybe we might thought. We took a, you know, a lot of you know energy or you know efforts just to extend to the non-signal um, uh, uh, setting. And here I can, I can share some of the, I think, conceptual difficulty that we encounter that may be also generic to other, you know, non signaling security, uh, you know, um, maybe proofing the device dependent setting. So, but, but, but like I said, you know, what do you want to do? You basically just want to, you know, extend the non signaling security for each step. And we want to have, a, you know, some random non signaling source, and we want to do the decoupling. And we use something called equivalent lemma in the quantum setting, and we are show you know this, you know we we don't believe it holds in the non signal setting, and we have way around it, and also we show you know there's some difficulty to just talking about how you can control the errors in the composition when you're dealing with a non signal uh, system. So I will see how much I can cover. Maybe not too much, but let me just go through that. So the first part is the uh, the summary randomness. It's a uh, it's just like a block of uh, you know string, and we know if you look at some block, its marginal will be uniform. So we achieve this uh, you know quantum security using a quantum proof strong extractor. So some object you can just assume is uh, it give you the nice construction like this. Um, basically, we if we have a mean entropy source in, and we just enumerate all the seed, we generate each output, and you know. Put them together, we know the sum block will be uniform. And what we can conclude is even stronger. We can uh, use the pre processing to show that block is uniform even to all the possible devices. If we start with some mean entropy source uh, has entropy to the device. So, so actually, this kind of uh, argument totally breaks down if we move to the non-signal setting. And why is that? So first, if you uh, look into our paper, we show if we want to extend the quantum proof uh, extractor to the non-signaling proof extractor, that's hopeless because such a thing does not exist. And we have a strong 
counter example to show you. this does not exist even for extracting a single bit. And maybe this requirement to, you know, uh, have the one you know block to be uniform to all devices that's also stronger, you know, much stronger requirement to to have in a non-single city. Um, so, so basically, you know, what do we do? You know, we we change our problem. We basically see, you know, this is now this is a very strong requirement, not necessarily for our construction to go through. So instead of uh, you know asking, you know, for uh, the block to be uniform to all devices, I just need to ask for this block for some devices. If you, you know, reduce the requirement, then you can hope for something good. And indeed, we can achieve this kind of goal, but we need to pay. And then we need to pay a lot. Uh, a lot in the sense that can still be, uh, we can still afford that. Um, so, well, I mean, I, I want to, uh, I won't show you how you can prove that, but so this also explains why, uh, you know, or g give you a hint that why our uh, non-signaling protocol has, you know, way, way more boxes than the quantum one. So I'm even trying. Okay. So, um, so just let me go through the second point quickly. So we, we I mentioned there's a equivalence lemma thing for our quantum security proof, and we don't know how to do that for a non-signaling case. And the way of doing that is just basically go back to see, you know, what uh, in our signaling protocol we can directly make use of. So by doing that, uh, you know, we have one good candidate. And um, so what we have done is because we now have a much better input to that protocol other than the sense of other running source they start with. So uh, we can modulize, simplify their proof, and we can uh, make it robust, and we can uh, so this one dim dimension, if you really look into that paper, so the original one, they 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 only show there exists a, a good function to get the final output, and we we can show you can that can be efficiently generated. So let me just quickly skip that. Okay. So the last thing, which is uh, I think this is a uh, maybe a very generic thing. So in order to uh, you know handle the final composition. So we oversimplified saying you have a uniform seed to start with for the analysis. But actually, what you have is something close to uniform. So you see this tiny arrow maybe not really uh, you know, a big deal in the quantum setting. And uh, so the, the, the abstract problem we really need to deal with is just imagine you have some local system. Uh, and you have a you know, global system like this. If you have a, you know, another imaginary system in the ideal world that is close to the uh, the local system in the real world. Can we find uh, uh, also uh, you know a good uh, global system in the ideal world such that the those two global systems they're close by? And we do know how to do that for the quantum setting and make use of a lot of quantum structure and. We we actually be, believe that you know such generic uh, you know uh, solution is not possible in the non-signaling setting, and so alternatively we need to basically repeat NSS with the you know the close uh, to uniform city in mind. So so basically, so this is the one key claim we we found uh, identified from the previous analysis. So what we do is you know basically by contradiction, if this does not hold. Uh, we want to construct some like a distinguisher. So this idea from crypto, um, and we prove a contradiction by doing that. Um, so I, 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 if there's one thing I really want to highlight, I think, uh, although I probably don't have time to tell you the details, is that this is a not you know very traditional property. It's a it's a property of distribution itself, and you're arguing about the probability of that uh, property to happen. It's very involved, and you see this. Uh, just by looking at the definition of itself, and this, you know, that's I think the, the most technical part in our paper. Okay, so maybe just let me summarize what we have shown. So we have shown a running amplification protocol under the minimum assumption. Basically, we reduce the assumption of the source, and it just need to be a, a local uncertainty, well, imply a certifiable global uniform randomness. So that's the way we achieve our, you know, what we call the ideal dichotomy theorem. 
And uh, if you care a little bit about the parameter, we have we need like poly one of epsilon mean entropy source to start with. If you want to certify epsilon close to uniform bits, and we do have uh, I do need to use a lot of uh, devices. And we also think we probably have uh, introduced some generic tools for, to deal with non-signaling system. And I think obviously open question will be you know improve our analysis. You know maybe. You know, we are just really pessimistic about our tool, or maybe you know, improve our construction. I think the main thing is to reduce the number of boxes, and hopefully, you know, such a thing can find applications in other, uh, you know, non-signaling stuff. Like maybe we want to show non-signaling security for DIQKD, or maybe for DR running expansion, or maybe even something more like non-signaling information theory. And I thank you. Uh, now, and uh, hopefully I can get some questions before jumping into the black hole. Thank you. <clears throat> questions? How much mean entropy do you need uh, for the weak source? I mean, we, I have shows like for if you want to certify one bit epsilon close to uniform, you need like a poly one or epsilon. If you're asking like what's the poly, I don't really recall. <laughs> is, is, is that your question? It's the fraction, I mean your source has n bits and I guess you need a fraction of mean entropy. I mean, right, so if, if your weak source you start with has n bits, uh -huh. How much mean entropy do you need from these n bits? What is the fraction of mean entropy? Or, well, or it can be arbitrarily small. I think it can be arbitrary, right? I mean, maybe my co-author can help with that question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, hi. Hi. There's uh, two systems I'm familiar with of mm -hmm. uh, reduced entropy random number sources. One is where you have a bias. So, for example, you get a bit string, it's 80% zero bits and only 20% one bits. Mm -hmm. And the other kind exhibits internal correlation. So, if you get bits, they tend to be self correlated, like 0000. zero, zero, zero. Mm -hmm. One 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 zero zero zero, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and in that in those cases, if you run a standard test like Die Hard, Die Hard against those random number sources, it'll indicate a randomness factor of 0 0.2 or something like that. Mm -hmm. Does this method give you similar numeric output as to the quality of the randomness? I th so I, uh, what I believe is that you know what you're saying is like more like a statistical test for you know testing how much randomness is inside the source. Um, so what we more you know care about is about like theoretical you know guarantee for you know follow this kind of mathematical definition. Uh, and um, so, see. I I don't think it's quite a comparable. Um, let me see. Well, will, will the um, underlying lack of randomness leak through into your reported numbers? Mm, well, I mean, I I don't quite see directly through our construction, but um, let's see. Mm. So in some sense, I think we we can we can treat you know you can treat our protocol is is some kind of you know more sophisticated test, yeah. and but there you you also need to make use of some quantum devices you know to help you do that test, and I think there's also one distinction uh, from what you said and what this is really about. So what you said, the running is coming from the source itself. So you say we have a source coming in and we do some tests, 
you know, if there's randomness, the source, you know, the randomness is coming from the source. But we, what we have shows here, the, the randomness or you know, what it really is truly coming from the devices, the quantum devices or the non signal devices. Mm -hmm. So all this uh, input, the main attribute source, is basically to help us to certify whether the devices are really you know, doing their job. So I think that the origin of the randomness is somehow different. But you know, if, we, you, if you allow such a kind of new t you know, mechanics adding to the testing randomness, you know, I think that's just a more generalized way of uh, certifying randomness. So that's also why we call it this certification of randomness. Yeah. yeah. OK, thank you. So if there are no more questions, let's thank Xiaodi and all the speakers again.